Celtic Stuff Live. Welcome to Celtic Stuff Live on the CLNS Media Network, the leading online provider of audio and video coverage for the Boston Celtics. I'm your host, Justin Poole, and joining me, as always, John Duke. And, John, I'm just going to say, finally somebody got a prediction correct. We're like, what, a third of the way through the season? Uh, maybe a little bit more, actually. Um, and I finally nailed it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Uh, three and one with a loss against Detroit. Although I will say, John, <sighs> that loss against Detroit. Yeah. I'm actually not that disappointed about it. Me it, either. It, it didn't frustrate me because two things. One, they didn't try to shoot their way back into that game from the outside the whole time. They continued to try to, to attack the basket. And that was my biggest concern was that they really couldn't own the paint against that matchup. And yet it didn't deter them from continuing to try Kyrie, obviously getting in there and scoring some buckets. But uh, I think if Marcus Morris had been his usual hot self that we've seen this season, they actually walk away winning that one pretty easy. Sometimes the shots just go, don't go down. And I think that's what happened there. There were some miscues on defense too. And, you know, really that winning streak was uh, against a, of the lesser teams of the league. Let's just say it that way. Great for confidence building. Great for getting them to climb back up in the standings. Not necessarily opponents that were really testing them. Um, and I'm not even saying that Detroit tested them, but I do think that there's a lot of improvements that still need to be made on defense. But at least offensively, when the shots are falling, they still found open shots. And Morris wasn't bad in that game. He was distributing. He was playmaking. A lot of things that we hadn't seen from him coming off the bench last year. He's really grown as a player, in my opinion. Not just because he's having a hot start to the year, but just in general. The way that he's inserted himself into that starting lineup. A big adjustment. Yeah. And and really did it seamlessly. Yeah, you know, he was he's been clearly the most consistent player. Uh, I think he and Marcus Smart are probably the most consistent players the Celtics have had through uh, this nearly two and a half month season that the Celtics have gone through a third of the uh, the A two games you know season, I, I, you know and I and I think you're right he he was um, you know he was not the hot shooting none of them were uh, you know I thought the the Saturday night game against Detroit. I felt good going into it because of the way the Celtics had played, but I think they also ran into a team there that was tired of getting their lunch hand, you know, taken from them. You know, the Celtics have kind of handled Detroit on a number of occasions, even though, uh, you know, I think Drummond has done well. I don't think the Celtics have, have walked away without, uh, with too many L's in those games. So, you know, particularly the back to back, uh, earlier or not back to back in terms of games, but back to back games at least. I felt like Detroit wanted to show the Celtics something, and the Celtics felt like, "Hey, we got we've won eight in a row. We're feeling good. We just blew the the Atlanta Hawks out last night. Eh, what you know?" And I think it was a good wake up call, hopefully, for the the upcoming games that we're going to get into uh, later on the show. That you know, look, this, these are real teams. You got to prepare for them, and I think that that's exactly, hopefully, the message that Brad Stevens is giving those guys. Like, look, this is. You gotta give more effort, you know, and the Celtics have always been good in the second half of back to back. Not so much. They looked more like a traditional NBA team on the second half of a back to back. So. Yeah, that anomaly is over, I, isn't I, it? it? Well, it was for one night at least. I, I, I still like the Celtics chances in the next back to back as they roll through the schedule. <laughs> Well, I think you predicted an undefeated week, and I think that that definitely could have happened if even Horford were healthy for that Detroit game. I mean, really, this was a week that three and one is is a pretty big success. Uh, the bench and the players coming off the bench, I, I'm not even sure I can call them the bench anymore, right? Because you have Hayward on the bench, you have Brown on the bench, just the players that are currently coming off the bench have played well together, and you even look yeah. back to that beginning of the week game against the Pelicans on Monday, they were super shorthanded. No Hayward, no, Hor no Horford, no Kyrie, and I said I thought that ultimately they were going to lose one of those games, just like I said it the last time, but, but it was Carl Anthony Towns in Minnesota, and they were playing the Pelicans, and of course they rolled both of those games in the previous prediction I had. But this time they did run into it. I thought maybe that would be an issue with the Pelicans. If I had known the injuries that were going to be playing out this week, I would have stuck with probably saying that that Monday game was going to be the loss to the Pelicans and not the Detroit game. Um, but 
really a fantastic performance on Monday against New Orleans. I, I was really impressed with the way everybody's energy was out on the floor. And so I think that that those kinds of matchups are always a test, especially when Horford isn't around. You know who really was an all-star this week, in my opinion, even though he finished the Detroit game kind of week? Daniel Tice. Holy moly. He was hitting shots from outside, draining threes, really active. And I know we're going to talk about Robert Williams because he's a quick fan favorite. Everybody loves the Time Lord. We're all having fun. And he blocked two. This is kind of where I want to go, that he blocked two shots on Anthony Davis in that Monday night game. But really for the entire week, Daniel Tice, a guy that I pegged to really, you know, have a sort of an underrated season or maybe a player everybody forgot about that I thought would wind up having an impact. And here we are, you know, we're in December and he has to make an impact. And this week he did. He's really good, right? (laughs) He's a really good player. (laughs) And I think that that's, uh, it gets lost. It's been lost. I think thus far. I also remember he's, he was working back from an injury. You know, that's, that's the one thing that's, you know, we've talked so much about Kyrie and Hayward, but when you're coming back from that meniscus tear, it's pretty tough to, uh, to be able to just jump back and, and get back in the flow of things. He too was out of that playoff run. So it took some time, I think, for him to find his footing, but boy, he, he showed it in a big way there on Monday, Monday night against uh, the Pelicans. He, I think the beautiful part about Tice is he, he does a little bit of what Horford does. You know, he's 80% of, you know, he's not the passer. He's not the defender. He's not the shooter. He's not the, 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 uh, he doesn't do the little things to the degree Al Horford does. I and mean, arguably you could say who does in the NBA, but he, he does give you a little bit of enough of that so you can still run the stuff you always, you run with Horford. You know, he still allows you to have, to pull that center from the basket. Um, it didn't work as well against the Detroit Pistons because nobody was able to hit shots. But, but I thought that he was, uh, he has been, you, you've seen a steady, uh, growth from him and a steady improvement that I think will be something that the Celtics can bank on pretty reliably. I'd love to see more instances where they're able to throw different looks at teams. It seems like the Celtics, the center position is the one place where they can really change up the entire way in which the team plays. You know, if it's Horford, they can go this direction. If it's Baines, they go in another direction. I think those, those things are really somewhat interesting in terms of, uh, watching how this, how that happens. And it allows the Celtics to be much more, uh, unpredictable in terms of how you play against them, and how you match up against them. Yeah. He's so. Uh, you know, he's a rim runner to some extent, and he's very active. He's very mobile, and I think that that's why, t- to what you're saying about the comparison with Al Horford, why that's there. He can really move around the floor, and so they're able to do a lot of the things that they would normally do, but they don't give up as much size as they might ordinarily for a player who is that mobile. And that's, you know, obviously we see, and we're going to get to this in just a minute with Robert Williams being a mobile player, you know, maybe not nearly as polished and as experienced as Daniel Tice, but certainly valuable minutes. But it's a similar kind of thing. In today's game, they both fit very well with the way that the Celtics want to run their offense. And even defensively, you're not getting killed on those switches. And they do them all the time. I mean, Kyrie was in some really interesting matchup switches this week that I thought he did a pretty good job as well. So Daniel Tice gives you that same flexibility. To your point, not to the same effectiveness level, but pretty damn good. And I would say this week, even on the shooting, sure, he doesn't quite set up you know, that little hook shot in the post, but everything from the outside was equally as effective as, as, equally as effective as you would expect from Al Horford. So hats off to him for really steadying the course that way. Hey, as a reminder, everybody, you can follow Celtic Stuff Live on Twitter at CSL underscore Tweet Live. You can follow me at CSL underscore Justin. John is at CSL underscore Duke and the entire CLNS Media Network at CLNS Media. Facebook.com slash CLNS fans and download the CLNS Media app for iOS and Android. Simply search CLNS Media in your app marketplace. Finally, YouTube.com slash CLNS Media for high definition, full length locker, locker room interviews and the garden report. All great stuff. You'll find Celtic stuff live there as well as the round table. That YouTube channel has got it going on. So John, why don't, why don't we just talk about 
the men in the middle, right? Let's just go to the next step. We were talking about Tice, but we did get a little bit healthier because Baines is back. Definitely needed him uh, in that Detroit matchup. He did a very good job as well, uh, just dealing with Drummond. They were mixing it up. Very physical game between the two of them. That was great to see. And then we just had that athleticism from Robert Williams, like I mentioned before, the two block shots on Anthony Davis. And everybody throwing up alley-oops to him. And I thought, I think it was Brian Scalabrini that made the point in the, and I believe it was also the Detroit game. Um, but he said, everybody's starting to expect that now. So you've got to watch out for the one dimensional aspects of trying to lob it up to him. But man, not only him, but really to Daniel Tice too. And we saw Baines get some really nice passes, um, going to the rim and kind of rim running more and more of that. Yes, please. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's the, I think that was a key piece that was really missing in the early going of the Celtics season. I mean, look, they're not, they don't have a lot of players who are really great at drawing free throws. I think Jalen Brown is, is, is a guy who can do that. I think that, uh, you know, Hayward can do that, but certainly this week and, and, and prior, you know, they, they're both are coming back from illness. I think that slows some of that in, in, in recent games, but I think that having those bigs putting that pressure on the rim and putting pressure on the bigs really does allow for uh, a lot of uh, a lot more creativity and a lot more uh, aggressiveness from the wings and the guys on the outside and i think and particularly playmakers like Kyrie and and smart and hopefully and add, add Hayward in that mix in fact, even even uh, Tatum, Tatum is, has shown a late a little bit more of that playmaking gene. I think that having the bigs doing that rim running, crashing cla- crashing the rim, trying to get um, put that pressure on the on the big and have them choose: Am I going with the wing or I'm going with the big that's rolling? I think that that is that's a, a bit of the secret sauce here. That if the Celtics can shoot it and rim run, which is something they really haven't done a lot of, they did a little bit with some good success with Smart and yeah. Horford. More cutters, more, more cutters. this year. I think it's yeah. going to help this overall roster. Yeah, hundred percent. More cutters, more cutters, and send them from every position possible. And I think that's why that it even like that's not something we saw from Baines. I don't even really think very much last year, and I don't think we've seen it at all yet this year. And yeah, just the other night, I saw him cut, I think, two, maybe three times, two successfully with a really quick up to the rim. I mean, it just doesn't give the defense a chance to position on blocking or anything. It actually winds up being very smooth. And to your point, the entire team really moving the ball well, looking for that. And that was kind of my point about Marcus Morris at the top was that he was really looking for those plays. I think actually the Baines plays, two of them were feeds from Morris. Uh, I might be recalling that incorrectly, but I think that's the case. Let's go and, with it. Yeah, we'll go with it because somebody <laughs> can fact check me, send me the video, uh, or give me some nasty notes on our YouTube channel. But I will tell you that I think that's really one of the most important things that can happen for this offense and the chemistry on the squad is sharing the ball and seeing, the, you know, we, we see Bain start a game, you know, the whole structure, we tried so hard to lay down how we thought that the starting unit would go and how the substitutions would go. And then they just kind of really laid such an egg that Brad totally rocked the starting unit. And then with Horford out, there's Baines kind of getting into that starting lineup when, you know, Tice has obviously made some starts when Horford and Baines were out. And so, you know, the whole, the whole plug and play scenario, I think is great for chemistry because people are getting minutes, people are getting opportunities. And, uh, and I think that's really taking that edge off of trying to figure out, you know, what's my role on this team? How do I fit in? All of those questions that were killing some confidence that sure, those were lesser teams in that eight game winning streak. However, I really think there's a lot that they can take from that. And hopefully as you and you, you know, said that in the bottom half of the show, we'll be talking about the week coming up. Hopefully they'll be able to take that. And then there's some road trips coming up after Christmas. It's all going to be really necessary for them to continue and and sort of have that confidence. So liking what we're seeing from the men in the middle, as you might say. All right, everybody. 
I'm going to tell you real quick about 1 in 100 Boston sports fans. Do you want to get killer seats to see your favorite team for the price of a beer or a large pizza? Tired of paying for all those inflated markups from brokers or those last minute convenience charges just to pay courtside price? courtside prices for nosebleed seats go to one in 100.co that's o-n-e-i-n 100.co feeling lucky try it out now there's no other place that's doing online raffles to win tickets to events and it's a totally new way to score tickets to the boston celtics the cost to potentially get these tickets with one in 100 is a small fraction of the actual ticket price. You can score a pair of tickets for less than the cost of a beer. And also, your first raffle ticket is free after signing up. The experience of using one in 100 is extremely fun and exciting, from picking your lucky number to the feeling of potentially scoring premium tickets. Are you feeling lucky? Try it. One in 100.co. That's O N E I N 100. Co. And I'm also going to tell you about Robinhood, an investing app that lets you buy and sell stocks, ETFs, options, and cryptos, all commission-free. This non-intimidating way for stock market newcomers to invest for the first time, yes, you can do it now with true confidence. I have friends that have been encouraging me to invest in cryptocurrencies, and now I've finally done it with Robinhood's easy-to-use app. Other brokerages charge up to $10 for every trade, but Robinhood doesn't charge commission fees, trade stocks, and you get to keep all of your profits. Learn how to invest as you build your portfolio and discover new stocks and track your favorite companies with a personalized news feed. Custom notifications for price movements so you never miss the right moment to invest. Robinhood is giving our listeners a free stock like Apple, Ford, or Sprint to help you build your portfolio. Sign up at CelticStuff.Robinhood.com. That's CelticStuff.Robinhood.com. All right, John. Uh, I think we need to spend a little bit of time talking about Hayward and Brown. You know, obviously Hayward missed the night. Uh, limited minutes. Uh, the rest of the week, definitely not 100%. Um, Horford still struggling with the knee, whatever diagnosis it is. It seems like it could be lingering. Um, hopefully he'll be back, but they're going to have to obviously just save him for the postseason. That's where we want him. And the team is deep enough, I think, to survive. Although at that position, they do miss him greatly. But then we look at somebody like Jalen Brown, who's kind of come back into it. And I think I want to start there, even though we've talked about, you know, we have injuries to talk about that are still kind of ongoing. That's a guy that missed some time due to injury, lost his place in the starting lineup, moved to the second unit, has been pretty aggressive since then, isn't just setting up on the wing, you know, in the corner for the three anymore, doing a lot more attacking and driving and slashing, although he got out on the break against Detroit and completely fumbled. I think he was almost going too fast. Like, he doesn't realize that his athleticism isn't limited to speed. And I wanted to get your take on Jalen. How do you? How are you feeling about him? And then we'll move to the rest of the uh, still remaining or lingering injured Celtics. Well, he's he is definitely returned. Uh, I, I don't want to say the playoff form, but he's returned – I'm going to put last night aside maybe a little bit, um, because, you know, certainly returned and, and, and since being out, I think that's, that's a, you know, put, let's put the, the last week, I guess, aside, um, and, and give him some time to kind of come back. But I think that the return from injury from after the back injury, he showed a, a, a really nice willingness to attack, uh, attack the rim, put, become a, a guy who could get to the free throw line. Um, and I think that, you know, Jared Weiss did a really nice piece on the, on the athletic, uh, detailing some of that and, and why, uh, why it's working, what he's doing well, but also where he still has areas of growth and certainly playmaking remains number one, probably among those. But I think for the Celtics is that fifth guy, that fifth option, fourth, fifth option. Um, I think all they really need him to do is drive closeouts and hit open threes. You know, they don't need him in a playmaking role. If he's a secondary playmaker or maybe even third, uh, in the pecking order, if he's, if he's in those bench units with Hayward and, and Rozier, I think that's a fine place for him. Allow him a little bit of opportunity to make some plays, but really as, as a secondary player to that. And that's unfortunate on this team. He's not going to be out there creating and, and becoming the next Tracy McGrady, a guy who he worked out. This with uh, this past summer, but 
that's what the team needs him to do. And I think ultimately he'll be better for it, but it's, it's a tough spot for the guy. And I, I don't think it's going to be as bad as it was. And we had, we had Bill Simmons out here ready, really to, ready to send him away for a pick or something. I mean, it was, people were getting a way over the line on, on Jalen Brown and thinking somehow he had lost his mojo. He hasn't. It's just, Everything was going wrong with the Celtics to start the season. And he was just among the, the last to kind of refine his form. He yeah, Rose. right. It was almost like it was getting laid at his feet, right? Yes. Yeah, he was, like he was, he was to blame. Kyrie figured it out. Uh, you know, maybe you could say, you know, Tatum figured it out. And then, you know, at that, around that time when Hayward was moving to the bench, it was like, oh, it's Jalen Brown. Jalen Brown's fault. This guy sucks. <laughs> Jalen Brown was the Come one on. was responsible for Hayward's. You know, not right. being like a stellar all star right out of the gate. And so there's another player we have to talk about, right? Is, mm-hmm. is, is how are you feeling about Hayward? Cause there's moments and there's been games, but the consistency just really isn't there yet. I don't think. No, I mean, definitely not. I mean, there's, there's nights when he looks like an all star. There's times when, uh, you know, and, and I think it's becoming more often than not. I, I don't think it's a, a situation where, you know, you're saying, well, once every five games we get you know, the old Zeller rule, you know, one every 10 games, you had a great game from, from Tyler Zeller. You know, that's not what we have going on with, with, with Gordon Hayward, but he is somebody who he's, he's struggling to find that consistency night after night. We, you know, and I don't think that's, a, that should be a surprise. And I think that's probably the last thing, probably before his athleticism to come in. Uh, that we should be waiting for is to find that consistent level. And you can, it's completely understandable why. I mean, the guy has to f- basically relearn how to play the game of basketball without all of the gifts that he has been working with for, you know, a long, long, long time. And all of a sudden now those are taken away from him and he has to relearn how to play the game. And, you know, there's times probably the ankle is more troublesome than it is, but then it's not, but that's just, I feel like that's, his ability to elevate issue. is still there, though. You know, and obviously the playmaking is there, which is why he is so suited for coming back with that bench unit. I mean, that's just such a good fit so that he can feel like he can contribute in other ways. But, man, there's moments when he goes up for a rebound or he gets up high to lay something off the glass. I'm like, man, you know, you really you really got it back. Your ups are there. But then there's other times when he goes up, and I swear it's like, You know, he's like a foot lower off the ground than he was, you know, the game before. And I think that's a lot of it, too. I don't know if that's trust and confidence or if it's conditioning or we have heard that he's, you know, it's still in pain, right? The ankle is still bothering him at time. You know, it's just part of the road to recovery. But definitely some concerns there. Maybe not. I don't want to go to Horford quite yet with the knee. I want to make a nice little stop along this injury train. Yeah. And I want to ask you about Gershon Yavaselli because there's your man, right? Yeah, and, and this this was his time. If you consider Horford being on the bench, boy, what an unfortunate missed opportunity. And it's only going to hurt him more downstream right. because as Robert Williams gets those minutes, and he's more mobile. I mean, I don't want to say that mm-hmm. Gershon for his size is very mobile, but Robert Williams athleticism and ability to alter shots and, mm-hmm. and defensively, even his positioning. I keep watching his feet in the post. I watch him manage the paint. I'm like, man, this kid definitely gets that aspect of the game. Um, there are moments where he still lapses and maybe he doesn't quite rotate and th- all of that's there, but I mean, I gotta think, you gotta spend your time developing Time Lord right now over <laughs> Yabaselli. And with Tice playing the way that he is, it almost is gonna knock Yabu out of that rotation, even when he does get healthy. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm very no, concerned about that. No doubt. No, no, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, a game like the Detroit game was, was tailor made for, for Yabu to come in and play next to Tice or next to Time Lord or next to, uh, to Baines. And, you know, just unfortunate timing for that injury. He was playing well. I mean, it just sometimes it works that way. You know, sometimes there is a, a luck factor to all of this, and unfortunately, it, it was not working for uh, the dancing bear. But it's you know, he he is somebody. He has gifts offensively that I think Time Lord still lacks. Certainly, you know, Time Lord can catch a lob. He's he can, he's got a nice size, nice, nice soft touch. Wow. 
uh, around the basket. But Yabu, well, he can't shoot the three. Yeah, right. I mean Yabu That's hasn't Yabu. Shot, Yabu hasn't shot the three well yet, not as well as he could. You know, right. I'm sorry, but the DAP makes me nuts. It's definitely but it's a down it's a downgraded. Point yeah, but it's the arrow, me. and then it's the you know. No, on. it's a downgraded. Dabaselli, Dabaselli. I know. Eh. It's, it's you know it's this this game is about basketball, oh, not man, river. So okay. <laughs> Get off Justin's lawn, everybody! But, but you're right that uh, that's the one thing that could hold Robert Williams back: the Time Lord mm-hmm. not being able to shoot threes, and probably never really going to be shooting threes. You know, could be the one thing that really keeps him out of a lineup, out of a starting lineup. You know, situationally coming in off the bench, all of that. You know, I think he's going to get consistent minutes in this league easily as long as he continues to show the work ethic, etc. But it definitely helped having him next to Horford. And so what a great transition point there. Horford, the bum knee, the time off. Maybe they felt like this was a good stretch. Maybe they were forced into it. I almost feel like if he had to play, they'd roll him out there. But instead, they're just taking extra time just because of the schedule. A lot of time off in a lot of these games. I know last week was a little bit more regular game schedule. But here we are in the middle of another three days off before their next matchup on Wednesday against the Suns. And we'll get to that in just a minute and close out the show. But I feel like they're just kind of taking advantage of this stretch. They feel like they could take that hit. Uh, maybe Detroit was the one matchup that they really couldn't. And I feel like the Pelicans matchup was the one where they were forced into it. And so they probably just said, you know what, let's just give them an extra week or let's give them an extra two weeks. Um, let's take it slow. And, you know, like we said, it's allowed Daniel Tice and even Baines, who was down for a little bit, gets Baines back into his rhythm and it gets Tice back into his rhythm. And, you know, they have the talent on the team. Maybe they felt like they could suffer through it, especially in the midst of a win streak. It always helps when you, you're not fighting to stay at 500. Yeah. I, I think this is the first time in the season they've really felt like now we can let people kind of take a night, take a night here, take a night here. We've, we've got, we've got our mojo. We've got our, our flow. We, we know who we are. We know how we win. We know how we lose. We know what, what it means to be successful as a team. We know what you do. We know what you do. We know what you do. And now the guy who kind of stitches a lot of that together, Al Horford, you can actually now let worry less. That's, that's the optimistic view. The pessimistic view is that there's something going on with that knee. And, you know, for them to, uh, you know, all of a sudden for it to blow up on him and say, oh, I'm, you know, he's questionable to play, that worries me a little bit. I feel like we don't, you know, it's patella tendonitis apparently, you know, and that's something you can just deal with. And I, I know that, but, um, yeah, Are you scared think, a little bit? I mean, I don't want to belabor bit. this. I don't want to belabor this. Until, He's 32. It really drags on, but it's the, it's the whole contract. It's the whole age. Yeah. And, 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 you know, that's why I think we've all talked about, and it's not just you and I on this show, lots of people talking about that next yeah. deal. You know, would he take less money? And, and honestly, we haven't gotten into this and there may not be time for it or there really isn't time for it, but you know, and really it was covered in Celtics beat. So maybe we'll give it a week and you know, we'll hash our take on it. But the, the ability to resign Marcus Morris, you know, a guy like that is playing as well as he is. It's going to be unfortunate if they can't bring him back, you know, and the, and the rotation is really tight, especially as these younger players continue to come along. And can you really expect that many people to be willing to come off the bench, you know, for year after year, mm-hmm. Marcus obviously playing for a contract. Let's also be really clear on, you know, there could be a letdown after this year as well, right? So those things happen in those contract years. We've seen players go out and win their money, but it's been very beneficial to Marcus. You know, he's going to be one of those Evan Turner cases, except way better, right? Where he's going to look back at his time with the Celtics and say, you know, the opportunity that I got on that squad made me a pile of cash. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't know if he's going to make as much as Evan Turner did, actually, just because. Well, he deserves more, and I think he's a better player. But at the same yeah. time, because of the market, he's going to end up not doing as well. Yeah, and it's going to be a crazy market, but I don't think it's not that crazy. It, look, it was when Evan came out. And, it, and to converse the, the other side of that, I'd say Marcus Smart 
Talk about a guy who went, got his 52 million and now is playing the best ball of his career. So, you know, on the one hand, you know, yeah, after all two guys have, his value by punching, well, uh, you know, a picture in a hallway at a hotel. No, really I, this time I, I, it's uh, a bad look in a contract year. Yeah, but I think we overreacted to it because I think he was going to get the money, you know, and, 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 and he rescued it in the playoffs. He played well in the playoffs. He helped lead them to a great run. I think, I guess my point is that, you know, maybe there's more DNA there that those guys share in terms of that desire and that ability to, to play the right way. And, uh, yeah, it was, it's great. Great for Marcus Smart. Credit to him to continue his consistent effort and, you know, I'm not as as optimistic Marcus Morris ends up here when you have now Tatum needing more minutes, you know, Jalen Brown needing more gonna minutes. He's going to go get minutes. That's what he's doing it all yeah. for. It's going to be yeah. tough. All right, so let's look at the week ahead. Uh, three games on the docket unless we one. decide to come back uh, and do it a little bit early considering we're heading into the Christmas holiday uh, that we celebrate coming up here in the next weekend. So we're definitely – Suns and Milwaukee. Obviously, Milwaukee's the big one. Uh, that's Wednesday and Friday. A day off between every game this week. That's nice to see. And then Charlotte next Sunday. So we'll either come back a little bit before that Charlotte game or we'll come back the next morning on Christmas Eve right at, and we'll obviously record essentially post game after the Charlotte matchup. But let's make our predictions as if the show isn't going to be back until after the Charlotte game. So, I mean, Suns have played the Celtics tough. I think we roll them just like the Atlanta game. Um, the Milwaukee one is really the big test. You know, was all of this success really because they were lesser opponents or, you know, are they there? And then we have the game against Charlotte. And so, uh, I'm going to say they go three and oh, and here's why I've seen them play tough against Toronto and I think they'll do it again against the Bucks. And, uh, I think they've got some bodies that they're going to be willing to throw at, at Giannis. And I hope they do. I hope they try to mug him up a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I think the Celtics, I agree. They do go three and zero this week. Phoenix is terrible. Uh, historically bad team right now. Um, whether they trade Ariza or not, or they get crazy Kelly Oubre, whatever. Um, I, I'm, I'm good with that. Uh, I think that, well, uh, just talking about quickly about Charlotte. Charlotte's a tough team. That's a team the Celtics struggled, had a, a real tough game with Kemba Walker coming in and really killing them with the pick and roll. It will be interesting to see how the Celtics offense, or excuse me, Celtics defense is willing to respond to that with Booker. Well, you know, you have, if Booker were healthy, you know, that he was also in that run there that Kemba started. So can the Celtics contain Kemba Walker? Uh, on Sunday night, that will be a really key, uh, thing for, to, to watch. In terms Torched of them the last time. Out. Torched them last time. Absolutely. So that's a tough game. I think Celtics want some payback there. I think they want to show Milwaukee they're still the Kings. I think this whole thing of sitting Horford is part of that mix. So I feel very good. I'm with He you. defends you know. Giannis well. I mean, he absolutely. had a lot of success against Giannis in the last matchup. I think that that definitely bodes well, and it's a great point you're making. Maybe that's the reason to rest up Horford. Um, really good points. All right, so we're both going 3-0, and and for all you listeners, we may be back on uh, like a Saturday, or we may be back after the Charlotte game, so just keep those feeds updated, but that's going to do it for this week's show. The broadcast will be available on demand on the CLNS Media Mobile app. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at CSL underscore Justin and at CSL underscore Duke. A heartfelt thank you to everybody for tuning in. And remember that you can help support the show by subscribing to Celtics Stuff Live on iTunes and Stitcher. We'd love it if you gave us a rating and a review because your feedback is important to the show. And for staff writer Samuel Elias, who knows Sammy! Executive producer Larry H. Russell, the founder of CLNS Media, Nick Gelso, and my co-host John Duke. I'm Justin Poole, and thank you for listening to this week's edition of Celtic Stuff Live. Celtic Stuff Live. Dude, I love how you roll your eyes. Every time I bring up Marcus Smart and the hotel incident, you're like, dude, when will you, and you know, I'm a huge Marcus Smart supporter. I don't, I don't, that was when you lost him. Remember? Yeah. I remember the first time. Trade him. I'm done with him. We're dropping him off at Goodwill. Imagine where (laughs) we'd be right now.
God. If we had, but you're right. Like he lost me right then. I know. The first time I was a staunch supporter that I was like, forget it. But it's just so funny. I mean, I know most, you know, people watching on YouTube, if we select the clip to play, you know, we'll see you roll your eyes. But the people who listen to the episodes, like the minute I say it, I look at the screen and your eyes are like way back. In Ooh, come on, <laughs> Justin. No, we went through this. We were wrong because I did join in you. I, I did not. I was very disappointed as well, but I didn't go as far as you did, nearly as far as you did. We were talking about it. And, you know, you were like, let's trade him. We can't even trade him. Can't even trade him for a pick. <laughs> no, I no, off just give away. Cut him. Dude. I was like, oh, my God. No, man, no. <laughs> Stop, Justin. Don't do this to yourself. And then you went back there. You, you know what's you're, funny you're about it is uh, is my willingness to, like, throw some some shade his way after being such a oh, I know. Unbi- like I mean totally biased supporter the like call is at coming the time the house. that at the time you know I was being genuine and honest but yeah. it but it it felt like objectivity except I'm really not sure it was a it was a, an objective opinion at all on the situation oh it's so funny I still can't believe it. I still can't believe you went I cannot believe it oh my god That's so funny. Good stuff. So funny. Wow.